We're wrapping up a two-part series today on grace and truth and finding the importance of a balance between the two. Two portions of God's Word. First, from John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then fast forward to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel in verse 6. The words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Let's pray. We pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth the thoughts of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some of you know that when I was in high school, my life was taken, well, let's say, the wrong direction. I'd have gotten involved in a, a numerous types of things that weren't good, occult practices like astrology and ESP, astral projection, telekinesis, Seances in the church basement, and I don't know how we ever did that and got away with it, and reincarnation. A family friend was well aware that I had gotten involved in all this, and as months went by, day by day, it, she became more and more bothered, but she didn't say anything. One Sunday, when I happened to be at worship, she came over, and I could see her coming across the room, and she had a piece of paper in her hand. And she handed it to me, and she said these words. Read these and ask God if he's pleased with what you're doing. And I said, okay, didn't think about it, stuck the piece of paper in my pocket. I could see as I was putting it in my pocket, there were seven scriptures written on that piece of paper, but it went into my dresser drawer with all my pocket change. There it laid for months until a Saturday afternoon when I wanted to go out, but I didn't have any money for gas. You know, you go through the, the, the chairs in the living room, and I finally got to where I had some, I thought, some change in my dresser. And I put my hand in there, and there was no money, but there was Nan's piece of paper. Out of curiosity, because I couldn't afford to go anywhere, you know, back then, even a dollar could give you some gas. But now, it costs a dollar just to lift the handle off the pump. There that piece of paper had laid for, for months, and I decided, since I didn't have anything else to do and couldn't get out, that I'd read some of her scriptures. I started by reading Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. I went, hmm. Will drive, because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Well, I put the paper down and I thought, that's the Old Testament. And old stuff's no good. So maybe there's something in the New Testament. And so I went to the New Testament. And I found two portions of scripture. One is 1 Peter 5. Nan had written these words out in her own hand. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be alert and, sober, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in your faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And then 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the truth and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. The more I read what Nan had provided me, the more I became convinced that what she had given me was true. 
No human being was trying to convince me. No debater was trying to beat me about the brow and the shoulders with it. I was just reading the Bible and having a different experience than I'd ever had before. Months later, a pastor explained to me how this works, that when God wants something written in his scripture, then there was someone that the Holy Spirit would come upon and under the guidance of the Spirit, the writer of that would be inspired to write it. And who knows how many years passed, somebody else might pick it up. And the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writer would also inspire the listener to hear God's word. And that's what was beginning to happen with me. Hebrews chapter four, verses 12 through 13 says this, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Why was Nan's approach so effective? Why did it change my heart to see that those occult practices were not pleasing to God? I believe today it was because Nan offered me that day a balance of truth and grace. She trusted God's spirit to be at work. She didn't try to change me or control me or beat me about the head and shoulders with the Bible. She didn't tell me I was going to hell if I kept doing those things. John 1, 14 again, the, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth grace and truth. Jesus was filled with grace and truth. The character of Christ has two ingredients, grace and truth. If we want to be effective in reaching the lives of other people, we've got to do it the way Jesus did it, with grace to go along with the truth. The early church was effective in reaching thousands of people and leading them to Jesus. How'd they do that? Because they did it the way he did it. A balance of grace and truth is like a checklist of Christ-likeness, if you will. It's like a plane. The gospel flies with two wings, the wings of grace and in truth, and they have to be balanced. If you've ever flown an airplane, you know you have to watch that little witch diggy that has the two uh, wings, and you have to keep those wings balanced or you're in big trouble. Last week, we explored grace. Someone wrote this about grace. Christ took the hell he didn't deserve so we could have the heaven that we don't deserve. So many of you, it was really interesting last week to talk to many of you who after the service left and told me that you had attended a church just like some of the ones that we were describing. Churches where there was more judgment than grace. Churches where there was truth but without grace, where you were defined more about what you were against than what you were for. So what is truth? Someone put truth this way. Truth without grace breeds self-righteousness and legalism. Grace without truth breeds deception and moral compromise. Is it possible to embrace both? And the answer is yes, if Jesus can do it. With his help, we can too. I'd like to, to explore with you three levels of truth today. Three ways to see truth. And I'm going to tell you now, I may offend half of us in the room. If the culture is a ma measure of who we are, then we all see things a little differently. Let's look at the three. First of all, we'll call it the guardrails of truth. Godly living is not about what we can avoid, uh, avoid. it's about what we can embrace. Anytime we talk more about do's and don'ts than we do about Jesus, something's wrong. The Christian life is far more than sin management. Somebody wrote this, behavior modification that's not empowered by God's heart-changing grace is self-righteous and as repugnant to God as the worst sins that people gossip about. 
People who grow up in a joyous religion never feel that they can quite be perfect enough to make the grade, and they lose hope. A smart traveler doesn't curse the guardrails. He gives thanks to guardrails even if they dent your fender because then you look over and you see all the cars that didn't make it. One of my favorite places in the summer and in the fall to go on vacation is a little valley up in North Carolina. It's almost on the North Carolina-Tennessee border. It's called Cataloochee. Years ago, the government went into the little community of Cataloochee Valley and they bought all the buildings, all the stores, all the churches, all the houses, all the outbuildings, you name it, and they did it. And they've maintained those buildings to this very day. They did it as a preserve for the, for the elk. It was awesomely a beautiful place. And people go there. The elk trumpet to one another. And it's an amazing thing. And then they'll have these big racks and they will come and hit one another as a way to fight for dominance. In the afternoons and evening, the people begin coming. Dozens come up the mountain each afternoon. They pull into the arena-like area that actually almost looks like a football field. And they begin to tailgate like you would picnic at a football game. After a few miles, though, you realize that the big challenge is getting up the dusty road to make it into the valley. After a few miles, the road gets primitive. And then you see the sign. Here I am in my minivan. And the sign says, where'd the sign go? Sign says, four-wheel drive vehicles only. And I look around and I think, hmm, I don't see any other minivans coming up here. Well, 15 minutes more, the road begins to turn to dirt. And it begins to narrow even more, and the guardrails disappear. Sharp switchbacks challenge the driver, and over the side there are 100-foot drops over a cliff. When you meet other cars, somebody has to move over. And as the road is just one lane, it's tough if you're the out, on the outside looking down. But that happens. When encountering other cars, drivers cautiously make their way and passengers begin to pray. You see lots of Jeeps, but the real challenge comes when you see coming around the curve and you meet a motorhome. Do they make four-wheel drive motorhomes? I've never seen one of those. And when the motorhome comes, you don't just have to get over, you have to pull into the ditch if you know what's right for you. But the guardrails are there. The guardrails are not there to punish us. The guardrails in life are there to protect us. The guardrails. Number two, defining truth. Jesus prayed this in John 17, 17. His words are recorded. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. You see, truth is more than just the facts, ma'am, like Sergeant Joe Friday used to say. It's not just something we can act on. We can't change the truth. But the truth can change us. Hebrews 4.13 says the word of God is living and active. Romans 2.15. God has written his truth on human hearts. Shame and twinges of conscience come when we recognize that we're violating the truth. There's another passage that say, in the New Testament that says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. What that means is, literally it means from the, from the Greek, let the peace of Christ be an umpire in your heart. When you're going along in your life and things are feeling good, remember back when you gave your life to Jesus, when you do that and you have that experience of conversion, there's a peace. There's an inner peace that just sinks into your soul. And it's there. And as long as you're following God's direction, that peace just keeps going. That's great. Keep going. You're going in the right direction. And you have that inner sense. But when you turn, like I did, and, and walk away from God and do things that aren't pleasing to God, that peace begins to lift. And you wonder what's happening. And you can't sleep at night. And things really bother you. 
That's because that peace is becoming an umpire in your heart. People's hearts long for truth, even when hearts reject it. The Bible says we are to walk in the truth, 3 John chapter 1. That we are to love the truth, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That we are to believe in the truth, 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. All truth has a center of gravity, Jesus Christ. The one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus didn't say he would show us the truth. Jesus didn't say he was going to teach us the truth or that he was going to model the truth. He, it says that he is the truth, that he is the truth personified. He is the source of truth. He is the reference point for everlasting claims about truth. That's why if we get it wrong with Jesus, it doesn't matter what else we get right. Anytime you have a question about what somebody believes or there's some religion that you're not sure about, the one thing that is the litmus test is what do you do with Jesus? Is he who he says he is in the scripture? You and I can discover truth, but we can't create truth. What's true is true and what's not is not. Now our culture sees truth as something inside subject to revision, according to our growth, according to our own spiritual enlightenment. The culture sees truth as something inside. The Bible sees truth as something outside, which we can believe or not, but we can never change it. Truth isn't about our own perceptions or our own desires. Truth is always about reality with a capital R. The majority of us could agree that we'd like gravity to be suspended tomorrow. It's really making a mess out of my physique. But no matter how many of us vote, is it going to change gravity? Not at all. Americans embrace democratic ideals. And this gives us the illusion that we have a voice in what we call truth. But the universe isn't a democracy and truth's not up for grabs. We so easily confuse what we want to be true with what is actually true. Too much teaching today is popularity driven, not truth given. Listen to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. One of the areas where we need more truth and balance today is in the issue of same-sex marriage. The truth of God's word, it seems to me, is clearly that marriage is between one woman and one man. But our culture sees truth differently. If we were to take a poll right now in this room, how do you suppose it would come out? My guess is we might be polarized if we would do that. That's why we need a balance, a balance of grace and truth to continue to talk to one another and to listen to one another. Finally, perhaps the greatest test of truth comes from what we'll call Truth Test 101, and it's this. Is Jesus the only way to God? What did he say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are times when I admit I wish he had stopped there. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he didn't finish there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Golly, that's such an exclusive statement. It's a struggle. The most influential theologian in America today just might be Oprah Winfrey. Ophir's spirituality is a hodgepodge of psychology, recovery, and out-of-context scripture. Ophir's way is a church-free, build-it-yourself spirituality where all the roads, wherever you're going, all the roads go to heaven. Karma? Sure. Fate? Why not? Reincarnation, she says, could be. And, what are, and where we are 
throw a little Buddhism and Hinduism and New Age and angel guiding living. What is most popular today is that have it your way designer religion made in order for the post-Christian era that we're living in today. Ofer doesn't talk about things like biblical inspiration, human sinfulness, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, the resurrection, or hell. Why doesn't she talk about these things? It's because they specifically define spirituality, including the ones named on her program. Ofer says this, quote, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there is only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to what you call God. But Jesus didn't say, I am a way, or I am a truth, or I am a life, or I am one way to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Raised in a culture that condemns such thinking as narrow and intolerant, even many Christians consider this way of thinking arrogant to think that Christians are the only ones going to heaven. It certainly would be arrogant if we were the ones that were making up this statement, but we're not. We're just repeating the words of Jesus. We're not trusting in ourselves, we're trusting him. If it were up to us, I don't know about you, I'd rather make up a statement that was a lot more popular than that one is. But it's not up to us. Sadly, some Christians believe it inappropriate to share Jesus with people of other faiths. When the Jews for Jesus come to town on an evangelistic campaign, there are many Christians who say that we have no right to reach out to our Jewish friends. But let's consider that for a moment. If you can see someone canoeing down the rapids, and they're out there in their canoe, and 100 feet from the rapids is a huge waterfall. Getting his attention and shouting a warning may cause the canoeist some anxiety. But is smiling and waving and keeping quiet the loving thing to do in that situation? Of course not. It would be pathetic, and it would be cowardly, and it would be uncaring. Going to an eternal hell is not anyone's best interest. How dare we, in the name of false grace and in the name of tolerance, would hold true grace from anyone Jesus came to save? The paradox of grace and truth is a paradigm. People need the direction of truth to know where to go, but they also need the empowerment of grace to help to get them there. I believe that people today are thirsting for the real Jesus, the one who is full of grace and truth. We show people Jesus, but only when we show them the grace and truth that he offers and nothing more. Let's pray. God, thanks for your goodness. Thank, that, thank you that you are God full of grace and truth. Help us to find that balance in our lives to trust people to go the way that you have for them and to love them through the process. We offer ourselves to you. And I pray today for anybody sitting here who wants to make that step closer to you. It happens when you pray a simple prayer like this one to God. God, I need you in my life. I need to have my past forgiven. I need to have a reason for living. I accept your offer today of a home in heaven when my time comes. Thank you for your goodness and love for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh...